I was very quickly disenchanted just by the mass production. Things that were inventory on the shelves often could end up in the trash. Rochelle Rosencrantz had established herself as a furniture maker and an industrial designer, both in her native France and in Rhode Island. But about a decade ago, she decided it was time to explore something new. I missed working with my hands. That was the bottom line. And I started to play music again. So that really like propelled everything. Rosencrantz first came to Rhode Island as an exchange student at RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design. She had an internship with a company in Providence before heading back to her home near Paris. The company where I did my internship called me back and said, hey, we need a designer. We enjoyed working with you. Would you like um, to work with us again? I said, you know what? Eight months in Providence was a bit too short. I will give it another two, three years. And 18 years later, here I am. <laughs> what do you love about Providence? It's small enough, you feel part of it, but it's big enough, there's always something going on. It's great to be an artist here if you're a visual artist or a musician, it's a good place to be. You're not far from Boston, you're next to New York. I mean, it's, it's a good place for creative people. There you go. And over the years, Rosencrantz says, her own creative process faced some inner struggles. If it wiggles a bit, yeah. She felt torn between being a musician and a visual artist and dreamed of combining her two passions. Was there a moment when you realized, gosh, I can make a living making guitars? Yes and no. Uh, yes, I w yes, other people do it, so why not me? And I've been thinking about it for too long to not do it. And no, because it was scary. It's like, it's a drastic change. It was worth the risk though. Worth the risk because she believes she has an obligation to handcraft guitars sustainably. I think you have a different respect right. for nature and the way trees are being harvested, the way trees are being cut down, versus somebody who's just buying a guitar at a store. Right. <laughs> They're not thinking about where are these materials coming from. That's true, from. that's true. And most people don't know even the woods that are in their guitar. And most people don't even know the type of structure that's going on inside their guitar. Rosencrantz says the environmental impact of making guitars has been well known for decades. Much of the timber used for guitars comes from old rare trees that produce good acoustics like ebony, mahogany, and rosewood. Excessive harvesting of Brazilian rosewood in particular has contributed to its extreme endangerment. It's one of the reasons why she's selective about where she buys her wood. My rosewood is from India. My maple is from the States. My, I have some cedar from Spain. I have some cedar uh, from California. Rosencrantz puts in long hours in her guitar studio in Cranston, which sits right below her apartment. She has a two-year wait list for customers looking to buy one of her handmade guitars. But when the pandemic hit, she says business came to a halt. Musicians are my clients. Musicians were not working. If they are not working, I'm not working. So it was a phone call, an email, text message saying like, Oh, this guitar, can we put the construction on hold? My tour got canceled and, you know, things like that leading one to another. Like, okay, so now what? I'm like, well, now I have all the time in the world to finally build the things I always wanted to build and experiment with that I never had the time to, to do. Because you had no business. Because that year the business went from building like eight guitars to zero. She used that time to experiment with making instruments from other materials while working part-time at RISD. Take, for instance, the body of her guitars. They're not carved, they're grown. Rosencrantz packs her molds with mushroom spores as well as organic waste like corn husk. That whole bag might do the trick. Actually growing a body in mushroom is cheaper than cutting a tree across the world. That's just the bottom line. It doesn't look as good as, uh, you know, figured maple. It looks like a granola bar, 
but there's kind of a brutalist, uh, you know, aesthetic to it. <laughs> the growth of the mushrooms fills any remaining spaces and binds it all together in the shape of the mold. Then, once it's dry, Rosencrantz is left with a solid board. Yeah. Her friend, Mark Miloff, stopped by her studio to try it out. Pretty close. Because it's mushroom, I think of really delicious uh, porcini soup or something like that. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, there's definitely a distinctive sound. It, it is absolutely not a wooden guitar, a wooden resonance. Uh, there's something that is, uh, I find, very pleasing. She's not the first to see the potential in mycelium, the thread-like branches that grow beneath mushrooms. See, this guitar in, encourages that kind of music. It doesn't encourage... Oh, maybe it does. I just love the sound. Many industries are taking note. For instance, these Adidas sneakers were made from it, and IKEA has been using it as an alternative to styrofoam. It's not like um, a hippie solution, you know. It's actually like tangible solutions with actual everyday application now. But uh, I saw like, well, nobody's looking at the acoustics of those. What if maybe there's some solution there too. So I gave the bees a soundboard to build from. Rosencrantz not only proved mycelium can be used to make guitars, but she also built one from honeycombs. The humming of the bees is within the range of the guitar. It's 309 hertz. That's close to like the A string on a guitar. So I'm like, okay, so that should diffuse a guitar. She knew honeycomb was resonant. She designed a bracing structure and watched as the bees built their comb along it. But then she found herself with a honey-filled guitar that couldn't resonate. So I had to leave it a whole winter, but for them to eat, because it's cruel to like take, you know, take all their food. They worked hard and now they're gonna starve. No, I can't do that. So. Well, they had food for the winter and they returned in, in uh, early April. I had a, a perfectly cleaned up guitar that was full, like empty of honey that could resonate. Rosencrantz admits strumming a guitar made from honeycomb isn't practical, but she says it's helped her better understand how biomaterials can diffuse sound. What drives you to explore these biomaterials to make instruments? It's just fun. It's just like I'm having a blast. I'm learning so much. As I'm working on one, I start to have like five other ideas. There's so much curiosity that the learning curve is exponential. And she clearly likes a challenge. While she's working more with biomaterials, she still uses wood to make guitars, including woods that crafters once overlooked. I see a lot of people now are using local woods. We see the use of Osage Orange around Illinois a bit more. Osage Orange behaves almost like ebony. And people thought it was like trash wood in their yard. And now it's treasure. So it's just to look at things differently. And, you know, really having like some figured maple is just for the prestige of it. If you close your eyes and you listen. Actually, Popper does a pretty goddamn job <laughs> for like the same density. I mean, I'm curious, you're someone who goes to bed every night and you feel better about the way you're leaving the world yeah. than you found it? <laughs> I do. I mean, I'm still worried <laughs> about the, the state of the affair as far as pollution and, and the consequences that we can feel already, just temperature-wise. and but. I feel better that I'm trying not to contribute to that and that I educate myself on that and I can also educate others uh, though. So, you know, I, I feel, yeah, <laughs> I feel better than 10 years ago. 